horror genre has had its ups and downs in its short lifespan. From the onset of its popularity in the 90s with classics like Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil, and Silent Hill, to more niche titles like Dino Crisis, Clock Tower, Parasite Eve, and Blue Stinger. Just as it was starting to get its footing, it seemed to peter out as horror games were seen as not as profitable as other genres. Sure, you had titles like Fatal Frame, Siren, or Internal Darkness during the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube era, but horror games were slowly fading from the AAA gaming space and settled nicely into the indie scene. Games like Slenderman, Amnesia, Outlast, SCP Containment Breach, and Five Nights at Freddy's took the indie horror scene by storm. Nowadays, the horror genre in terms of AAA games is slowly re-emerging. Titles like the short-lived PT, Alien Isolation, The Call of Cthulhu reboot, Until Dawn, The Evil Within, as well as Resident Evil making a massive comeback with the Fantastic Seven, along with the remake of 2 and 3, as well as the upcoming Village, which looks mwah. Not to mention more multiplayer focused spins on traditional horror games like the Friday the 13th game, GTFO, or Dead by Daylight. But smack dab in the middle of this roller coaster ride was a title developed under the short but sweet time where EA was committed to funding something that wasn't Battlefield or Madden. In the early 2000s, EA Redwood Shores, later renamed Visceral Games, started working on System Shock 3 of all games. While development at Visceral was progressing smoothly, Capcom would drop the video game equivalent of an atomic bomb on not only one of their beloved series, but an entire genre with the release of Resident Evil 4. With its focus on action and the new revolutionary third-person perspective, the team over at Visceral were inspired to shift focus away from their original design documents. As the game morphed and evolved, Visceral would eventually scrap the idea of a third system shock in favor of a brand new IP. That IP would become one of the scariest games of the last generation, and a personal favorite of mine, Dead Space. As a first attempt for the genre, Dead Space nails almost every aspect of what the team at Visceral set out to accomplish. It has an interesting story filled with mystery and intrigue, top-notch atmosphere, restrictive yet responsive controls and gunplay, and a setting unmatched in the horror genre. Players step into the boots of Isaac Clark, a lowly engineer headed out on a routine repair mission with his team. The USG Ishimura, a planet-cracking vessel, has gone dark in the orbit of Ages 7, and has sent out a distress signal Isaac's team has the misfortune of answering. As the team moves closer to their goal, their ship is struck by a meteor and crash lands on the planet cracker. As the team investigates the Ishimura, it's clear something is off. There's no one to be seen, blood stains the floor and walls, and the power is barely holding on. This sets the scene for the initial attack, causing the team to get split up. Sandra, power! Sandra! Come on! Got it! Isaac, get the hell out of there! The doors are locked! The majority of the game sees Isaac and the player fixing or repairing sections of the ship to escape. If you're familiar with Paul W.S. Anderson's Event Horizon, you'll see the similarities with Dead Space's story. While trying to escape, Isaac and company stumble upon more than just a simple repair job gone awry. The USG Ishimura, under the guise of Captain Matthias, was illegally cracking Aegis 7 after it had been put under quarantine by Earth's government for mysterious reasons. Those reasons are that it's the resting place of the Marker, a red, twisted obelisk that triggered mass psychosis, dementia, hallucinations, and paranoia on the colony of Aegis 7. The marker also happens to be worshipped by a cult-like religion known as the Church of Unitology, of which the captain happened to secretly be a member. The Ishimura took the marker on board to study it while commencing the planet crack. Upon doing so, it released the parasitic organisms known as the Necromorphs, who ravaged what was left of the colony on Aegis 7. The Necromorphs, along with the hysteria caused by the marker, led to the inevitable annihilation of the Ishimura's crew. Throughout all of this, Isaac has his own goal, and that's to find his girlfriend Nicole, who is assigned to the medical wing of the Ishimura. While things seemed bleak from the start, Nicole will occasionally reach out to Isaac through audio or video communication. She even appears to help Isaac a few times towards the end of the game. This is when Dead Space's big twist is revealed at the end, as it turns out that Nicole was dead the whole time, only coming to Isaac through hallucinations caused by the marker. It's a nice little twist that works in theory, but I feel if Nicole was shown or seen a bit more throughout Isaac's nightmarish trek through the Ishimura, it would have been a bit more believable. While the escape plot can be rather simple, it's elevated by the extra layer of unique background on the Necromorphs, the Marker, and the various members of the crew who met their untimely demise. Through some great organic environmental storytelling, along with the tried and true audio diaries and text logs found throughout the terrifying halls of the Ishimura. Fear is certainly subjective. What scares you or I might not scare everyone else, and vice versa. Couple that with the various categories of fear, like psychological, gross-out horror, or jump scares, trying to discuss what's scary or not can devolve pretty quickly. 
Dead Space rides a very fine line in the survival horror genre. It balances overwhelming odds with the stresses of being prepared enough to face what's around that corner or through that door. It's my personal preference when it comes to survival horror because the survival aspects are based off of your skills as a player. Having to keep an eye out for health packs and ammo, and assessing your inventory after each encounter, knowing if and when to heal, or picking your shots just right as not to waste your resources. It's a balancing act that's as fun as it is stressful, and it's the key to an excellent survival horror experience. Giving the player too much ammo or health makes them feel invincible, being able to take on anything in their way, ruining the immersion and the horror experience. Not giving the players enough, however, will have the opposite effect, causing players to get frustrated. Visceral hit the sweet spot, always granting the player just enough health, ammo, or credits to feel rewarded for exploring or killing, but not enough that players feel like Superman. It's what makes Dead Space so enjoyable for me. Being terrified of what lurks down that hallway, but knowing you've got just enough resources to fend it off, creates these unique mood swings that can shift from confident to terrified in an instant. Scenarios can go downhill rapidly, and it hinges on your skill and nerve. Getting caught off guard and panicking might cause you to fire too many shots you can't afford, taking hits you're not equipped for, and ultimately leading to your death. If you somehow survive, you're now left reeling with barely enough ammo and low health, making every move you make from then on critical. It's these moments that makes Dead Space so special. Much of this can be attributed to Dead Space's combat. Inspired by the over-the-shoulder camera of Resident Evil 4, Dead Space offers a very similar view of the action. Unlike Leon Kennedy, though, Isaac can move while aiming. Resident Evil 4's deliberate decision to keep players stationary was born out of invoking the fear of not being 100% in control. It's awkward on purpose, but it can still hinder some enjoyment from players, which is why the industry and the series itself has moved away from that type of control scheme. To get the same effect, Visceral added some weight to Isaac's movements. There's a slight delay in Isaac's lateral movements in aiming. It's not input delay per se, but it's more like a small amount of momentum in either one direction or the other. It's hard to explain, but it's noticeable when compared to something like Gears or any other third-person shooter. This is shown through Isaac's animations. His deliberate but measured gait, slightly hunched posture, his head always on a swivel. All these small details add to the composition of each terrifying shot down a long corridor or turning a corner. One of the best aspects of Dead Space's combat is how it's tied into its world-building and narrative. Isaac isn't a trained soldier or even a fighter. He's an engineer by trade, so the weapons players wield aren't your typical shotgun or pistol, but instead tools Isaac is more accustomed to. The ore cutting line gun, a hydrogen torch flamethrower, a disc ripper, and of course, the iconic plasma cutter. The only weapon that doesn't really fall into this category would be the pulse rifle, which the military or police force of the Dead Space universe use. Each of Dead Space's weapons are unique, all offering different forms of strategies of attack. For example, the flamethrower has a slow fire rate but does burning damage over time. The plasma cutter is a single fire weapon, whereas the pulse rifle is automatic. The neat thing about Dead Space's weapons is that they all have secondary forms of fire, offering some unique tactics during in combat. The plasma cutter can fire both vertically and horizontally, the line gun can fire explosive mines, and the ripper, while it's primarily a crowd control melee weapon of sorts, is a secondary fire that shoots the discs out at full force. Isaac also has a few abilities up his sleeve that help him survive during his time on the Ishimura. Stasis allows Isaac to slow down anything he chooses, whether that's objects or enemies. Stasis is mostly used on puzzles throughout the adventure, like slowing down malfunctioning doors or broken turbines and the like, but it can also be used in combat. It's helpful when overwhelmed, slowing down an enemy or two to run away reload, or focus on a larger threat. Kinesis allows Isaac to grab objects and move them from afar. Similar to Stasis, this ability is used for puzzles throughout the Ishimura, like moving platforms or flipping switches. There's more applications in combat with Kinesis than Stasis, as players can pick up objects in the environment to fling at enemies. Picking up an explosive canister, for example, and force pushing it towards a necromorph saves ammo in the long run. Stasis and Kinesis are neat little tools Isaac can use, and I feel Visceral did a good job utilizing them in interesting ways throughout the game. All these abilities and weapons, along with their secondary fire, Fire modes are designed for Dead Space's innovative dismemberment mechanic. Necromorphs are tough bastards, and conventional means like head or body shots barely phase these monstrosities. Instead, aiming for their appendages is the most effective way in taking down any threat. Video games, regardless of genre, need great enemy variety to keep the player invested longer from encounter to encounter. Dead Space's necromorphs are not only fantastic conceptually, but also mechanically. Slashers are the most common form of necromorph, and off-puttingly stagger towards the player, meleeing them with their blade-like arms. I usually take the legs out first to slow them down, especially when they attack in groups. Leapers crawl along walls and ceilings, charging the player once they get close enough. Once they charge, I aim for the legs to cripple them, taking out their tail to reduce the damage if they do get too close. Lurkers have three tendrils that attack at a distance. They're deadly at range, so taking them out quickly is key. Cutting off at least one tendril will stop them from attacking for a short time, but taking all three out kills them outright. Infectors, well, infect. 
It will attach itself to any corpse strewn about the room or hallway and turns it into a full-blown necromorph if not stopped in time. The key is to take these out first before anything if you can. They'll continue to add more threats to encounters until dealt with. These are just some of the standout monsters players will face in Dead Space. The necromorphs design are absolutely grotesque and I love them. They're one of my favorite variants on the infected trope, as they're unique in the way the host is taken over. They're not simply zombified humans, they're deformed and hideous, with skin and organs stretched or fused into unnatural shapes. For example, the guardian that's just a torso and head fused to a wall with tentacles sprouting from what used to be its stomach cries in anguish as if the human it used to be is still barely alive. The thin and lanky dividers are just muscles and tendons held together by a spider-like head that once killed splits apart and slithers away. The aforementioned lurkers are just reanimated human infants, which is terrifying. The necromorphs are the star of the show, and Dead Space would not be the same without them, as they're special as they are disgusting. They're the main reason why Dead Space's atmosphere works so well. Dead Space's atmosphere is almost near perfect. It's a seamless marriage of great visuals and audio while never relying on just one way to spook the player. There are jump scares that I feel are earned, like necromorphs being able to play dead, which causes players to be paranoid. That paranoia is layered upon with necromorphs being able to come from almost anywhere, from the ceiling to wall fans to vents in the floor. While there are some lame ones, there are more effective jump scares that catch me off guard and have my heart racing. Dead Space also knows when to slow down and creep the player out. There are subtle, less in-your-face interactions that are just uncomfortable. They send chills down your spine, not because you have to fight for your life, but because it's disturbing. Make us whole again. The setting is also key to why its horror works so well in my opinion. Space is inherently terrifying. To try to visualize how vast the final frontier really is is almost impossible as the abyss stretches far beyond our comprehension as human beings. An empty vacuum of nothingness, devoid of life, nearly uninhabitable. An ocean of darkness that will swallow you whole if you're unfortunate enough. In space, no one can hear you scream. The dark recesses of space play a big part in Dead Space as the main gameplay is broken up by zero-g or vacuum sections. Zero-g allows players to jump from floor to wall to ceiling using the environment to their advantage in either combat or traversal. Zero-g is also utilized for puzzle solving as well. Breaches in the ship's hull create vacuums in space where Isaac's oxygen levels are taken into account. This ticking timer adds an unsettling layer of tension as speed is key to getting to a decompression chamber before Isaac suffocates. The muffled effect on the audio and absence of music is a really great touch in these sections. Being able to see the planet's surface or stars out in space grants Dead Space an immense scale while also being a very intimate game as well. While the majority of Dead Space takes place in cramped corridors of the Ishimura, knowing that there's nowhere to escape to outside the ship adds this extra small but tangible layer of anxiety over the whole game. The audio design in Dead Space is on point, as it should be. Quiet moments where players can hear a pin drop, odd sounds off in the distance or right behind you as monsters scurry about in the darkness, Isaac's heavy breathing and grunts muffled by his helmet the more damage he takes. It all heightens the atmosphere tremendously. This makes the Ishimura a fantastically creepy place. Malfunctioning lights flicker throughout the desolate halls of the Ishimura, messages written in blood stain the walls, corpses of the former crew lay lifeless at their last stand against the necromorph threat. Dead Space's scare tactics blend perfectly with its survival horror design, creating a consistently great pace throughout the whole game. The visuals of Dead Space still hold up to this day in my opinion, and that's thanks to its design direction. Dead Space is set in the far off year of 2508, and with the far jump into the future, there are some appropriately futuristic elements at play. But what makes the visual design work is just how mechanical and rudimentary everything still looks. Most of the interiors of the Ishimura are angular and sharp metal structures, not too dissimilar from ship hulls of today. While there are aspects like holograms or floating HUDs, the majority of the ship feels more grounded and less futuristic. It's a great pairing of realistic and high-tech that feels believable, unlike most attempts at the future, where everything is sleek and bright white with soft edges and curves, something that would clash with Dead Space's horror focus. The different areas of this ship stand out from each other, being sectioned off into places like the medical bay, mining deck, and hydroponics lab. These areas keep the same ship aesthetic while making each section unique enough that it doesn't feel samey. It makes the ship feel cohesive yet varied at the same time, which is key especially when backchecking through some of the same areas. It's not just the environment designs that are great, but the level design that encompasses it. Dead Space is split into chapters, segmented by the parts of the ship I just mentioned. Each section of the ship is non-linear, meaning there's areas to explore off the beaten path, complete with a map system that 
that's useful when backtracking. It pales in comparison to something akin to Arcane's Prey, but the less linear focus makes areas feel more organic like this is an actual ship, rather than sections of the corridor pushing you towards your objective. Very Bioshock-like, no doubt remnants of the System Shock 3 designs Visceral had at the start of development. There's more elements that are reminiscent of Bioshock than just the level design. There's a small RPG aspect to Dead Space that ties very well into its horror elements. Shops are littered around the Ishimura where credits can be used to spend on ammo, health, and weapons. A small variety of items is available to the player from the beginning, only expanding once schematics for items like larger health packs or particular ammo are found. This incentivizes players to explore and search every locker or box around the ship. My favorite are the suit upgrades. Each level of the suit grants more inventory slots as well as just looking cool the more levels you progress. Suits aren't the only thing players can upgrade. That's where power nodes come in. Power nodes are used for a few things, namely upgrading the stats for your player's rig, your stasis and kinesis modules, as well as your weapons. Categories such as increased health, more damage or ammo capacity, or a longer stasis duration can all be specced into using one node at a time. Nodes can also be used to unlock doors around the Ishimura, which may or may not house a lot of useful resources. Having to choose to save the nodes for upgrading your line gun's reload speed or risking it and opening up a door that might have some ammo you're in desperate need of adds to the survival horror experience overall. I mentioned how excellent Dead Space's visual design is, and that extends to its UI, or lack thereof. Dead Space creates a unique sense of immersion with its very minimalistic HUD. Health is displayed in the colored tubes running up Isaac's back here, as well as the stasis gauge on his shoulder. Ammo count is only shown when aiming down sights, holographic projections serve as the cutscenes in terms of video conversations, quest updates, inventory, and map screens, the works. This seamless integration of the game's UI with its presentation makes Dead Space a better experience overall. I'd argue it ruined both the immersion and gameplay of Dead Space if the HUD elements were of traditional games, obscuring the player's view of their surroundings. Visceral did a tremendous job with the Dead Space experience, so much so it sprouted into a successful yet short-lived franchise. Two sequels, multiple spin-off games, books, and even an animated movie or two all started with the original Dead Space. While horror experiences come and go, Dead Space has stuck with me for the past 12 plus years, being my go-to survival horror game. Its unique setting, great core gameplay, and terrifying atmosphere, Dead Space is an amazing experience, and I only hope EA gives the franchise one more shot because it truly deserves to be up there with the greats like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. Isaac, it's me. I wish I could talk to you. I'm so... 